And welcome everybody, of course. It's great to see everybody. I hope, uh, as, you, as Janet said, I hope you've all enjoyed uh, your, uh, your buffet lunch. And as Janet said, my name's Tim Caulfield. I'm Managing Director of Griffin & King. I'm a Chartered Accountant, Consultancy Practitioner and Law Graduate. After qualifying a long time ago, I've spent around 20 years advising business owners about how to run profitable businesses, and in more recent years, I've specialised in rescue and recovery and debt advice. And Griffin and King are experts in all aspects of business rescue and recovery, including personal and corporate insolvency. Nothing else. We don't have an accounts department. We don't have an, uh, an audit department. We don't have a tax department. And we certainly don't do loans. We're going to introduce to our clients at a most difficult stage of their lives. And our clients tell us we show empathy, we show compassion, we show consideration. Above all, we show professionalism to guide them through a very difficult period. But don't take my word for that. Have a look at our website and see the testimonials from our clients yourselves. And here's a couple of recent ones. That's Spencer and Liz. So uh, that's what Spencer and Liz said about us. So why are we here today? Most of, most of you either advise business owners or individuals in one capacity or another or are in business yourself. And this talk will help give you a flavour of what we do and how we can help you to help your clients like we did with Spencer and Liz. So that brings me to today's talk, where we'll be covering the theme of change. We can usually assume that whatever circumstances we're in, whether it be in life or in business, that we change before too much longer. And it's how you manage that change that really determines the outcome. And this is a true story of a complicated and stressful case that we've dealt with recently. It'll highlight how industries change and what may have been a few years ago a profitable and successful company can become a dinosaur in just a couple of years. It will also highlight some of the recent changes in the insolvency industry that have been driven by the changes in technology and emphasis on efficiencies. So the areas we'll look at today are what's a company voluntary arrangement, that's a CVA to use a bit of technical jargon. Who determines whether a CVA is viable? What are the issues involved? And what are the new rules for the appointment of a liquidator? And the talk should take around 20 minutes. So Flintstone Limited. This is a story about a business that was profitable a couple of years ago, but the directors didn't react sufficiently in good time for when there were changes that affected their business and market changes that affected the whole industry. And the story starts one evening when was, I was driving home around about last March, and a local businessman I knew called Martin, he called me to say he's with a customer of his, Fred, who needed my help. And so I saw Fred the following day, and he told me a little bit about the company and about the problems. So Fred's company was operating in the printing industry, Based in Warsaw, they'd been trading for about 20 years. And they employed around 18 people. So it wasn't a small business. And over the years, they'd invested in new equipment to maintain their sales. They'd invested a lot of money. And unfortunately, they lost their biggest customer around two years ago, which is when the problems really started. And market conditions were putting pressures on margins and sales. And they were having cash flow issues operating at the ceiling of their overdraft and building up arrears to HMRC. But, Fred said, he really did not need my help. Martin had jumped the gun. And he went on to explain that the company was just about to enter in, into a factoring agreement, which was about to be signed, which would inject about £100,000 into the company resources and a property was being sold 
that again had inject about £100,000 into the company. And profits were just around the corner. Fred was really sorry he'd wasted the time, so I wished Fred well and went on my way. So, fast forward six months or so to August, that's last August, and I had an email from Fred's co-director, Wilma, and she wanted an urgent meeting. The bank were pressurising and wanted a report from an insolvency practitioner to the directors about the financial position of the company within seven days. So, no pressure there. And I saw Wilma and Fred the next day. And they told me that a factoring agreement was about to be signed which would inject about £100,000 into the company. And if you're thinking I have the, the slides have jammed, you're mistaken, actually, because this is the next slide. So they told me then that a property was being sold which would inject around £100,000 into the company, and profits were just around the corner. Now, where would I heard that before, I thought? And... The company accountant had provided a detailed 12-month budget for the bank that showed Flintstone would come through the present cash flow difficulties and return to profits next year without any insolvency process. The slide had jammed, by the way, but that's the <laughs> second slide. <laughs> so I thought, what, am I, what on earth am I doing here then? It appeared not a lot had happened in the last six months from what I could see. But I carried on quizzing Fred now because I had to do this report for the bank. And when I found out that there were losses in July and August that the accountant didn't know about who had prepared the budgets, and those weren't, weren't shown in the budgets, and they had a serious effect on the, on the cash flow of the company. And Flintstone had just entered a time to pay scheme with overdue taxes to pay HMRC, and there were numerous payment schemes with creditors that had recently been agreed. So things had actually deteriorated quite a lot in the last six months and looked very tight, and I thought perhaps a CVA might be the best solution. And just to break from the story, what's a CVA? That's a company voluntary arrangement, as I've said. But it's a formal agreement with creditors when a company is insolvent and can't pay its creditors as they fall due. And usually, a monthly payment is made from future profits towards CBA creditors, so it's essential the company returns to profits. And the company keeps trading, and the CBA creditors are paid what the company can afford over a, typically a two to three year period, and typically maybe 50 or 60 percent return to creditors but we've just done one with 100%. And once the period of the CBA has been completed and the company has complied with all its obligations, the balance of any unpaid debt is written off. And usually there's a specific reason why a CBA is preferable to a liquidation and a restart, such as the company has got a long-term contract um, or there's personal guarantees, which is what was the case with Flintstone. And that's why we were looking seriously at the CBA. But every case is different. So how does a company trade in a CBA, given that it's insolvent and unlikely to get credit? This is the difficult bit, and the experience of the IP is so important. And it's up to the IP to assess the viability of the plan. And effectively, unsecured creditors a ring fence and paid only through the CBA. And clearly, further credits won't be granted by those suppliers unless they've been negotiated by the directors. And it would probably be necessary to source alternative suppliers. Company bankers usually support a sensible CBA, which is essential to keep the bankers on board. It won't work without the bank support. And of course, management of cash flow is absolutely criti critical. Otherwise, the whole thing will just dry up. So back to the meeting with Fred and Wilma, I spoke to the bank manager who told me he was becoming increasingly concerned because Flintstone was operating outside of its agreed limit 
with no sign of things getting any better. He wasn't too impressed with the budgets that he'd been and he'd been considering appointing an administrator. Fred and Wilma needed to know the precise financial position of the company like yesterday. And of course, there was a bank manager bringing down our necks. I cleared my diary for the next day when the bookkeeper and Wilma could help me work on a weekly cash flow for the next six weeks. So we started work at eight o'clock in the morning. By about one o'clock, we got a framework to the cash flow. It wasn't easy. Some of the information was known by Wilma, some by the bookkeeper. Bits of paper here and bits of paper there. Some relevant, some not. I had to wait for other information to be emailed through to me that afternoon for me to complete the picture. And after a few chasing calls, it came through at around about six o'clock. The next day was a Saturday, and I was up at about six o'clock to plug in the final numbers. That's six o'clock in the morning, by the way, um, just in case you want to. Um, to, to I was up. Fairly early, it says, plug in the final numbers and review the position, and it didn't look good. I could see how a CBA, I couldn't see how a CBA would work, and the finances were only getting worse. There was only one course of action that the directors could take, and this was to cease trading and commence a creditors voluntary liquidation process. And I called them that morning, and arranged to see them on the Monday morning. Now that Monday morning was actually August bank holiday, <coughs> and it was the last thing I wanted to do, and it was certainly the last thing Mrs. Caulfield wanted me to do, but the directors needed to know, and they needed to make decisions. So what information had I produced over the last couple of days? Well, I'd produced a six-week cash flow that showed the company couldn't get back to operate within its authorised facility at the bank, and I'd produced an up-to-date balance sheet which showed the company was insolvent and which reconciled back to the last statutory account showing the trading results for the last six months. So, fair bit of work in a, in a small, short amount of time. And that's really what the balance sheet looked like. It's, I know it's just a jumble of numbers, but on the left-hand side there, we've got the net, net book values. That's really what the management account said. And on the right-hand side, we've got the estimated to realise, which is more, more of a realistic figure. And, and taking into account some of the things that we actually knew about the figures, like, like goodwill. I mean, what's the goodwill value of a company that's losing money? And the answer is not, not a lot, really. Um, the property, there was a small adjustment on that. The plant was slightly overvalued. Stock, stocks were, were quite significantly overstated. Trade debtors hadn't had a couple of uh, uh, bad debts accounted for, so they were overstated. Um, there was an intercompany debt within the management accounts of £75,000. Now that intercompany, associated company, that was insolvent as well and that was going to have to go through a, a liquidation. So there wasn't going to be any, any return on that. So that was a write down of 75000 And then all the others were, were basically creditors. So even though technically speaking the management accounts and the balance sheet was not far off being solvent, just 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 looking at those figures as they stood, um, there was in fact a deficiency of over £250,000 using uh, more realisable values and, and reflecting the necessary write-downs. And certainly the, the bank manager didn't accept for one second that it wasn't, it wasn't insolvent. So given that Flintstone was continuing to lose money, they just couldn't carry on trade. They would be wrongfully trading and setting themselves up for personal, debt, personal liability. That's the directors, of course. So the meeting on the Monday was difficult to say the least. Fred wanted to carry on and couldn't believe that the accountant's figures had changed so much. He was in complete denial. But Wilma, who'd worked more closely with the figures, could see that for the first time a proper cash flow had been prepared, which realistically reflected the difficult position the company was in. And Wilma let Fred rant on about the figure, the future of his business without any reference to the figures I put in front of him. I've seen that once or twice as well. And I had to explain why I didn't think a CBA would work, even with the sale of the property and the introduction of factors. It just wouldn't be enough. 
And it was one of the most difficult meetings I've ever had, and I came seriously close to walking out of it a few times. But things eventually settled down, and we agreed a timetable of, a, of two weeks for the company to cease trade and start the insolvency process. So during this 14-day four, period, a few things had to happen, and, and there was a few rules we had to, to work within. So the property sale should be completed. This had been dragging on for months. But it, if it could be completed, it would avoid further delay and the purchaser attempting to renegotiate. So that could be good news. No credit could be taken by the company, of course, during this period because we knew it was insolvent. The directors would have a bit of breathing space to see if there's any alternatives, and that's what Fred wanted to do. And the cash flow would be monitored on a daily basis and the report was agreed to be sent to the bank and I agreed to be out with the bank manager on a regular basis. And again, during this period, we spoke about the possibility of a phoenix. And if you don't know what a phoenix is, that's when a new company starts immediately where the other company stops. But the more we spoke about it, the more I just didn't like it. And why wouldn't a phoenix work? Well, the lack of preparation on behalf of the directors from the start of they, they really hadn't had bought pen to paper. They hadn't got a clue, really, about the finances and the potential finances. They hadn't got any resources. They were actually struggling themselves personally. They got personal guarantees that they were going to get called upon from the demise of the, the other company, from, from uh, Flintstone. And so they just hadn't got any money available at all. And there was a, a lack, a fundamental lack, of a successful business model. The old company was about to go bust, and there's a reason for that, and what was going to change. And again, they hadn't got the answers to that. The alternative strategy for the directors was that they joined forces with a competitor that they knew well. And that didn't need any working capital from the directors and made much more sense. And I did my best to encourage them towards the latter plan. We even worked through some figures to show this, this plan had the best chance of working. I've seen far too many new start businesses fall flat on their faces because of lack of preparation and resources. I'm pleased to say they chose to join forces with their competitor because I'm sure a phoenix just wouldn't have worked. So the next two weeks passed quickly and as planned on the agreed Monday morning, my colleague Mike and I arrived to see Fred and Wilma at 8 o'clock, as agreed at the company premises. So the things we needed to deal with immediately that day was that the directors needed to formally commence the procedure, they needed to sign up a few resolutions. We needed to agree with the directors how we deal with any work in progress and whether we retain any staff to complete that work in progress and the terms on which we employ those staff. We need to speak to the other members of staff and dismiss any that we don't need. We need, of course, to speak to the bank and let them know what's going on. We need to speak to the landlord and obviously um, agree with him how we stay in the property and how he gets paid and how we deal with everything. And then, of course, we need to speak to the major creditors. So we did all that on the first day and, and all of that went as well as it could have been, could be expected. And the formal process had, had started. Okay, just to break off from the story for a minute, I need to explain the rules in, about creditors' meetings and the appointment, and the appointment of a liquidator at that, at that meeting has changed earlier this year. And the rationale behind these changes is to bring the process up to date and reflect how technology, and particularly the internet, have changed things. And I'm sure you all come across the old style creditors' meetings. You'll be aware that they were called by an insolvency practitioner who had been appointed by the directors when a company was insolvent and couldn't continue to trade. And the real purpose of a creditors' meeting, and nothing has changed here, is to appoint a liquidator who, amongst other things, has then got the authority to dispose of the assets and investigate why the company has failed and investigate the conduct of the directors liaise with the creditors and nothing has changed with those basic principles. And under the old system, the exact timing of the creditors meeting depended upon notice periods to members, that's the shareholders, and was typically a period 
of around three to four weeks from that point of cessation of trade. And creditors didn't actually need to be physically present at the meeting to vote. The purpose of the vote was for the appointment of the liquidator, and a creditor could, you could send a proxy vote if they didn't want to attend. And a creditor could nominate an alternative IP if they wanted to. Under the new process of a creditors meeting, there's no procedure for a, for a physical creditors meeting unless requested by the creditors and the concept of a virtual meeting has also been introduced. So what's a virtual meeting? This is a new thing and we'll have to wait to see how much it's used in practice. It's what the name implies. <coughs> a date and time for the meeting will be provided in the notice given by the IP and any creditors can call in at that point with any questions to the directors or the IP. And if the creditor wishes to vote, he must deliver his proof of debt proxy form by no later than 4pm on the day prior to the meeting. And otherwise, the virtual meeting procedure is identical, identical to the physical meeting procedure that I'll talk about in a few minutes. And then we've got the deemed notice procedure. This is something very new indeed. And assuming the IP doesn't call for a virtual meeting, the deemed process timetable is triggered by the IP giving written notice to all creditors of a deemed date of appointment. And the deemed date of appointment means that the IP will be automatically appointed on the given date unless there's an objection by creditors. So how would the creditors object and actually call for a, a physical meeting? Um, so it would either be, the meeting would be called by a request of at least 10% of creditors in number or at least 10% in creditors in value. There doesn't have to be any explanation or reason at all. And one major change in the process and quite a radical difference is that the notice of the deemed date of approval has to be accompanied now by a full report and statement of affairs. Now you may recall that under the old process, the statement of affairs would only have been made available at the creditors meeting or one day prior to the meeting if requested by a creditor. So under the old system, the process could be started and information gathered from the directors to put the report and statement together over a period of weeks. But under the new system, the statement of affairs needs to be put together much more quickly and until it is, the process can't really be progressed. And us accountants know how difficult it is sometimes to get information from clients when we're trying to do the accounts. And this is just the same problem, but a lot more urgent. So what are the rules about notice? There's some very precise rules about giving notice of, of the creditors of the deemed decision date and, and, and the, uh, the meetings. Um, and there's precise rules about the notice days and post days. And there needs to be three clear business days notice to creditors of a decision date and this is increased by postal days. So just to briefly summarise, the statement of affairs and all the information related to the company needs to be sent out earlier now under the new system and the, also the notice period has to, that has to be provided to creditors has also been shortened as well. But this is the dirty bit that's, that's, that comes out of, of that situation. Because the information and the statement of affairs is sent out earlier, this gives firms of IPs with more resources a better opportunity to potentially push smaller IPs out of the way and get themselves appointed. I really can't see this being for the benefit of the creditors and other stakeholders, as to call a meeting of creditors would only serve to delay the process by up to 14 days and increase costs and have duplication of costs. But we'll, we'll have to see how that process works in practice and, and, and these things obviously develop. So back to the story of, of Flintstone. And if you recall, it had just ceased to trade and the process had started and there were things we needed to get on with. 
As I've done so much work with the directors, we're in a position to finalise the statement of affairs very quickly. I'd even had a valuation report done of the assets prior to the cessation of trade to save time. So we were appointed by the directors to start the process on the Monday. We got the notices out the following Wednesday, and there was a deemed decision date planned for the following week on the Thursday at 11.59 p.m., which is the exact time of day, according to the legislation, of the, the, the appointment will take place, if, if it does take place. all very dramatic, but that's what the legislation says. And if an objection came in any time prior to 11.59 p.m., we would have to call a physical meeting of creditors within the next 14 days. So that would be a further delay of 14 days. So we will often see IPs sitting around now until 12 o'clock before they go to bed, just waiting to see if there's any, uh, any late objections. Um, so the time of 12.59... 23.59 on the decision date came and went without objection and I was formally appointed liquidator. And this meant we could get on with the job and start formally dealing with the things we needed to do and, and look after the key creditors and the stakeholders. And what were these? So we could deal with the employee claims and get on with we getting the employee entitlements paid to the employees, the landlord, we could deal with the landlord and make arrangements for how long we needed to be at the company premises and what, what he could do about restoring the unit to its previous state. We could instruct our agents to commence the sale of, of plant and equipment and have an online auction, which is what, what we've done. We could liaise with the creditors and start agreeing any retention of title claims and liaising with their final claims. And then with HP and lease creditors, we could agree claims and agree when uh, equipment could be collected. And then with the directors, we could agree any value of the goodwill of the transfer of any customers. Um, and of course, with the passing of every day, that goodwill became eroded. Um, so we could deal with that. And then, of course, we could carry on dealing with the bank. And they were pleased that the existing relationship was, was due to continue. So. So that's really how things, how things moved on. Um, and we're still in the process of dealing with all that. So really that, that brings the, 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 the story to a bit of a conclusion as, as, as we stand. But just to, just to finalise things, what happened to, to Fred and Wilma and the new venture? Well, so far so good. Most of the old customers have continued to trade with the new venture and around five of the old employees have been offered new contracts, and that's okay. And what about Flintstone? As far as Flintstone is concerned, we are on track to realise the value of the fixed assets and debtors and should be a dividend of around 30 pence to unsecured creditors. So is there a moral to the story for Fred and Wilma? I'd say so. Get the right advice and act upon it before it's too late. If Fred and Wilma had got me involved in a detailed review back in March when they first saw me, then we could put a plan together that might just have kept Flintstone training. Perhaps a CBA with redundancies and other cost-saving measures could have worked, but it would need to be looked at carefully. And by the time they did get me involved, the information I put together for them over a very intensive couple of days showed that the accountants' budgets wouldn't work, a CBA wouldn't work, and the directors were well on their way to setting themselves up are being personally liable for the losses that they were incurring. And reluctantly, as the circumstances unfolded, the directors could see I was right, as usual, and they had no, <laughs> that's what I tell my kids. Um, and they had no choice. At least they took advice as far as the success of business was concerned. And as a result, they've still got an interest in the business that they've joined forces with, and they've still got a living. So what would have happened if they carried on? Well, they'd have probably had machinery repossessed by finance creditors, and encumbered assets could have been levied on by HMRC. There could have been a winding up petition, particularly by HMRC. There were writs and judgments. Those could have eventually resulted in, in being uh, levied on, on, on the, uh, uh, the, the assets. There could certainly have been potential personal liability for the directors and there could certainly have been a withdrawal of the 
facilities by the bank. And I'm sure the latter is probably the most likely that would have happened. Um, but certainly the business had reached a point where it just couldn't continue to trade and it was only a matter of days. So what are the warning signs for anybody who's running a business or any advisor um, to, that, that we need to look out for? Things like checks bouncing, a company operating at an overdraft limit and, and exceeding it or just never, never coming far, far away from it. Um, far under it and not paying suppliers on time obviously and any arrears to HMRC and if any of these signs are present in a company it invariably means there's a problem and the accumulation of them means that the company is probably insolvent and what did Fred and Wilma say about us <coughs> wake up Wilma You should be made to take an exam in understanding company finances before becoming a director. Looking back, we really didn't understand where we were until we got Tim and his team on board. Tim told us things we didn't want to hear every day. I wish we'd got Griffin and King on board six months before we did. Things could have been different. And believe it or not, that's something I hear people say a lot. Thank you, Janet. Thank you, Wilma. Uh, I was looking forward to that bit. Um, so what have we covered in today's talk? Well, we've covered what's a, a company voluntary arrangement, how an insolvent company can continue to trade and pay creditors, what it can afford from future profits in a, in a formal process. Who determines whether a CBA is viable? That's, that's an IP really, and, and an IP needs to use his experience to assess the financial position of a company and the viability of a plan. And if he hasn't got a lot of experience, experience then uh, he won't produce much of a plan. Um, and then we've looked at a brief, at a brief look at the new rules for the appointment of a liquidator. And we've seen how Fred and Wilmer have managed to retain a living and retain part of their old business. We've seen it's so important for directors to seek advice as soon as they see any financial warning signs. And insolvency is an area that most professionals don't deal with on a regular basis. It's so important to know who you can contact to get some specialist advice at the right time and plan together. So what do I want you to do? Have a think. Do you know a Fred or a Wilma or anybody out there who's having financial difficulties with their company, like we described. And if you do, please speak to me or one of my colleagues. We're always pleased to have a chat or a meeting without charge to explore options, and I'm sure we can help. What we're trying to do is avoid a formal insolvency situation. But the next best thing is a structured, planned insolvency process of which the director or the individual a good element of control. And just before I conclude, I'll ask my colleagues to, uh, at Griffin King, to, to briefly stand and make themselves known. Thank you very much. Sit down, Richard. <laughs> so, we've got Emma, thank you. And then, oh, Mike, Mark, of course, David, Sukdesh. Thank you very much. No, on this side. No, sit down, Richard. <laughs> thank you. And I know you've all spotted Richard. Okay, now. Thank you very much, everybody. And thank you very much for, for listening. Hey guys, have a good one. Let's have some air in the room. Yeah, come on guys, let's get going. Cool, exciting times. Right, I am Amanda. I'm from the Digital Garage by Google. I cover the Northwest region, which, as you can probably tell, is getting bigger because I'm here in Walsall today. I've been in Birmingham, I've been in Edinburgh, which is also in the Northwest. Been in Scarborough, Skegness, which are also in the Northwest. So yeah, pretty much anywhere that's you know north of London is within my remit now. And um, how many of you have heard of Digital Garage? One, two. So we've got a couple of people in the room. Have any of you been down to any of the presentations that we've done? No, or any of you been to? The, yep, you have. Any of you been to the physical garages? Okay, cool. So before we do the presentation today, which we're going to do after the comfort break. 
I want to talk to you a little bit about what the Digital Garage is. I want to talk to you a little bit about why it's important to upskill in digital skills and a couple of trends that are going on at the moment that you might want to think about that you can take away and kind of action within your business. So, first off, what is the Digital Garage? Well, it's a program that Google has put together designed to upskill and empower people within digital skills. Because currently in the UK, we have a massive digital skill shortage. Now, what has caused this? Well, partly it's been caused by the digital revolution happening so quickly. So if you think about it, since the inception of the internet, how quickly businesses have pushed to go online, how quickly people have turned to doing things online, and how even things that we do in our daily lives have evolved to being done online. For example, how many of you, when you're looking for a local tradesperson, will go to the yellow pages? Mm -hmm. Okay, so not a hand in the room. How many, how many of you would look online? So straight away we can see what the digital revolution is doing. Ten years ago, I remember pouring through the yellow pages to look for a plumber or a tradesperson or any, any kind of local trade. Now, I don't even think I have one in my house. I go online, I go on Google or I go on Bing or I go on an online search engine and I'll look for something within my local area. So if you are a local business, and you're operating within the local area, then in order to be found, it's not good enough just to be found offline anymore. You have to put yourself online and put yourself in front of the target audience, which, judging by this room, would all be looking online for a local service. Now, in terms of the digital garage, we come in three different formats. So we have an online training portal. So if you go away from today and you think, that's quite interesting, I want to I get to know a bit more, I want to kind of upskill myself, if you go to digitalgarage.withgoogle.com, you can do an online qualification. At the end of it, you'll walk away with a certificate and you will learn things about search engine optimization, pay per clicks, social media, um, building a website, all kind of broad skills that you can put together that can help you either within your own business or even if you, you know, you're looking for a job in digital, then that's another thing that it can help you with. The second format that we have with Digital Garage is what I'm doing here today, which is where we come out, travel around the UK and we deliver presentations on a range of different topics. So the one we're going to cover today specifically is going to talk about search engine optimization and pay-per-click, so online marketing, reaching new audiences online. We also do presentations on building websites, coding, um, social media, online security, there's a whole range of them. So again, if you are looking for something a little bit more specific or there's a particular area you want to look at, you can go onto the website and have a look around. There's loads in the area. Um, feel free to come down and come along to any of the presentations. The final format that we have, which is particularly relevant to you guys here, is a physical digital garage. And what that is, is it's a pop-up shop. Uh, we've got two at the moment. One is over in Sheffield, but we've got one in Birmingham. It's just near New Street Station. It's open from nine to five, seven days a week. And you can go in, you can book one-to-one -one mentoring. So if you want something that's specific to your business, by all means, please do ask questions today, but if you want more time and you want to sit down with someone like myself from Google uh, for a 40 minute session, then you can either go and drop in to the garage, it's open like I said, all the days a week, or you can actually book a session. They also run training courses similar to what we're doing today at the garage, kind of back to back each day. So if you want to go and learn a little bit more or get a bit more involved with what's going on, then please do feel free to go down and have a look at what we've got in Birmingham. Now, in terms of the training sessions, I quite like to make them quite engaged, so I like to have quite a bit of engagement. Normally when I say the word engagement, I get a lot of this, <laughs> right? But let me, let, let me teach you something. Um, I, last year for my 30th birthday, I went out to Singapore, went to Universal Studios. And at Universal Studios, they have a, sh have you guys seen Shrek? Yeah, hands, Shrek, Shrek, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, cool. They have a Shrek 4D show. Uh, it's, it's brilliant. It's really good. You go in there, they squirt water at you, they get donkey on stage singing karaoke. And as with most of these things, they ask for a volunteer from the audience. I won't be asking for volunteers today, don't worry. But they asked for a volunteer from the audience. So I, like head down, nah, not a chance, thinking there's no way I'm getting up on that stage. I cannot sing and I definitely do not want to be singing what they want me to sing. My partner, who was sat next to me, thought this would be a great opportunity to go like this to me, who had my head, like my hand, my head buried in my hands, trying to get them to pick me to go up on stage. Anyway, 
totally backfired on him because the, the nice lady that was at the front decided instead she was going to pick him to come up and sing. So poor Adrian sat next to me, who'd just been, there was a Waterworld show actually prior to that, and um, he, he volunteered for that as well, and they'd given him a gun, and he's like, yeah, I'm going to get to shoot everyone, and he went to shoot everyone, and then they both shot him and covered him with water. So he'd already suffered from this already in the day, then had to go up on the stage and sing Shrek karaoke. So you can see the lesson here, really, from him, was that actually it's probably better to put your head down and not say anything at all. But what I mean is when I do that, I'm going to ask a couple of questions, and I'm going to ask you things like my first question, which is, why have you come to the Google Digital Garage today? Obviously, there's a lot of people here representing businesses. What are you hoping to take away from the training session? Give me some ideas. Time to get to page one. Okay. It's really funny that you say that, because actually on my sheet of paper here, my next point is some common questions that I get asked when I come out to these events. And question number two is, how do I get to the top of Google? That's a question that I get an awful lot. And just to be completely straight with you, there really is no magical answer to that. Trust me, if I knew, I'd be there. I wouldn't be doing this. I'd be owning 10 businesses all at the top of Google. The way that Google works is it has an algorithm which determines where people appear in the search results. It's got about 400 different factors that go into that. There's a really great video in the training session we'll do after the break where Matt Cutts, who's the head of Google Webmaster Trends, talks to you about all the different things that go into it. There is no magic potion. There's a lot of things that you can do to your website to help Google see the value in your website. Things like making sure you're targeting your keywords, making sure it's fast, making sure it's user-friendly, making sure that it looks good, making sure that it converts. But there is no magic, unfortunately, to get to page one. Funnily enough, the other question that I get asked all the time is, where are you from? <laughs> 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 to which I usually say, well, actually, I live in Manchester. And then it goes to the next part of the conversation where they sort of look at me and go, yeah, but where are you actually from? And then I turn around and go, oh, well, I was born over in Crewe. And then it gets even more awkward because they just kind of stare at me with some silence, like I'm waiting to come out with something. So I'll answer the question, yes, I'm from Australia. Not New Zealand, not South Africa, not America, not Canada, not Germany. I've had some, honestly, I've had some weird ones. But that is, that is, in fact, where my accent is from. Now, in terms of talking about getting to the top of Google, we are going to talk today about search marketing and Google AdWords. And what I often get asked a lot, in addition to the two questions we've just covered, is, do I need to do marketing online? Because there's a lot of people here that might turn around to me and say, you know what, my business is doing really well. I get a lot of referrals. I do a really good job. And people refer people to me like all the time. I recently did a training session uh, with a boiler installation company. And there's a lot of people there that worked in trades. And they said, I haven't bothered with a website. I haven't bothered with online marketing. I just don't need to. My customers right now are not online. And you know what? Maybe they're not. But let's have a look at where your customers in the future are going to be. Let's have a look at where the younger generation is looking and where we're looking even now when we're not looking in the yellow pages. So what I'd say to people that aren't thinking about doing any form of online marketing is give it a go. Try it out. Think about setting up a website. Look at the potential audience that you've got in front of you. And even if you don't optionally want to set up some online marketing, there might be a time when actually you need to. So if you are a local business and you don't have a business listing or a presence online, then you're not going to be found to the audience today because they're not they're, good, they're looking for you online. And if you aren't online, they're not going to find you. More than that, research shows that when people go to buy a product or use a service, 90% of people look online for reassurance, social proof. So that's things like reviews, trusted third-party reviews, Trustpilot, FIFO, um, even Google reviews on Google My Business. People are looking online. The industry is competitive, and what online has done is it's opened up a whole new world of new competitors outside the current geographical area. So in order to present yourself well online, people are going to look you up. Even if you don't have a website, and even if you don't have an online presence or social media, people will go online to research your business and to understand what's going on. For those of you that have a business, how many of you have Googled it recently? And how many of you Google yourself recently? Come on, we've all done it, right? These are really important things to do. It's not being self-absorbed, it's not being conceited. But if people are looking at your business, I guarantee you, they're Googling you. So 
So it's really important for you also to Google yourself and understand how is my business presenting itself online. I've got new customers, they're looking for me. They've maybe, even if they've heard of me on radio or they've read about my name on a billboard, they're going to find out more information. They're going online to find that information out. So even if you have thought, I don't want a website for new business, I don't want an online presence, I don't need more customers, think about the where people are going to get information about your business and how you're being perceived online. Even if you don't have a website, take the time to search yourself in Google, search for self and being, have a look at how your business is coming across and make sure that it's coming across the way that you want it to. So why do we come out and talk to individuals? Well, we find that when people do online marketing, a lot of people might use an agency. Does anyone here use a web design or a digital marketing agency? Okay, so there's a couple of people in the room. One thing that we really want to do is empower individuals to have the skills and the understanding, to really understand what's going on and take control of their online web presence. We find that a lot of companies just say, oh, I'll just give it to the web design agency, I'll just give it to the digital marketing agency. Whether you're a small, a medium, or a large business owner, if this business is something that you've invested time in, then you want to take control of it. You need to understand how it's coming across and understand how you're marketing yourself. The training courses that we run are designed to allow you to take control, and even if you do work with an agency, to give you the knowledge that you need to be asking the right questions to ensure that you're heading in the right direction. Now, just finally, before we take a break, before we start the training course, think about the future. How many of you use like a home device like Google Home or Alexa or a voice control device? So a lot of research has come out recently that says by 2020, around 50% of search is going to be done by voice. So we're going to start adopting these kind of devices into our daily routine. Now, it depends what you really want from it. If, like my partner, you sit there um, and you play, there's a game that you can get on Alexa, I think, that bas where it basically asks you, uh, a question with two answers and you can sit there giving the answer and it's, it's very monotonous and I've seen him sitting there for hours doing it. But if you do use it for a practical purpose like, um, you know, where is my local such and such or where can I buy this, voice search is something that's going to become really prevalent. How prepared are you as a business for such a large proportion of your audience potentially to be searching for you on a voice search device? How prepared are you to be visible on things like social media? Social media is growing. We've got 44 million people using social media in the UK at the moment. Again, a lot of people might use Twitter to uh, potentially complain about things. They might use Facebook to complain about things. But if you offer a level of customer service, the speed and the style at which you address those things is going to make a difference on the way that people view your business. So even if you haven't been thinking about getting an online presence, Think about all the different ways that your business could be portrayed online and consider that when it comes to thinking about how you market or you own that space that you have for your business online. Finally, just before I sit down, we're going to have a Q&A session at the end of the training session and we'll do some questions during it as well. I would encourage you to take the 10 minute break that you have now to just think about things that might pertain to your business or questions that you might have. Um, it's a great opportunity for you to ask anything that you have that pertains specifically, I guess, to marketing, because that's what we're going to be covering today. But take the time to have a think, write down any questions that you have, and we'll do a Q&A at the end. Cool. Thank you. I'm back. How was your break? Did everyone have coffee and cake? Have you guys had the cupcakes? I think a bit of a, a, bit of a round for Janet, bringing the cupcakes in. They were delicious, weren't they? Mm. Yes? Beautiful? Very good. All right, now, what we're going to get into today like I mentioned earlier, is talking about how we can go about reaching new customers online. So I'm going to start off the presentation by talking some facts and figures. So talking about what the kind of visibility is like online at the moment. And I'm going to go through a couple of specific marketing platforms, most notably kind of tips and tricks for search engine optimization. And then we're going to go through our Google AdWords and pay-per-click advertising. So if you don't want to do the organic search, you don't want to do the search engine optimization slide, or you feel like you want to kind of get more instant results, then we'll talk to you about uh, Google's advertising platform and what you can do with that. OK, cool. So here's our agenda for the day. First and foremost, we're going to look at how we can help your business show up on Google search. Secondly, we're going to have a look at Google Analytics and see how we can use that to find more customers. So how many of you use Google Analytics at the moment, just out of interest? OK, so we've got a couple on there. So Google Analytics is a very powerful tool. It's got a whole host of information on there, which sometimes can be a little bit overwhelming. 
So for those of you that do use it and those of you that potentially want to get more data out of your website, we're going to have a look at Google Analytics and how you can use it to get those kind of data insights and make actionable improvements on your website. We're then going to go and have a look at the understanding the benefits of advertising online. So that's things like um, pay-per-click advertising, Google AdWords. We'll talk you a bit through how the pay-per-click kind of advertising side of it works and also how you can create really good ad copy and landing pages, which are really important to making sure that you have a good advertising experience. Okay, first and foremost, helping your business show up in Google Search. Well, why is Google Search important? Okay, how many of you have seen this screen this morning? Maybe on your way here? Yep, okay, quite a few people have seen it. Google search is important because, first of all, a lot of people are using it. But secondly, what it allows you to do is it allows you to capture your visitors at the moment when they're actively searching for something that you offer. So the difference between this type of search advertising and things like billboard advertising or TV advertising or a lot of the things that you do offline is when you do a lot of offline advertising, you're putting your product or your service in front of people at any time. So perhaps when they're staying at a bus stop or they might be driving along and they might see a billboard. With Google search, you're putting your product or service in front of people when they're actually searching for it. So let's say, for example, I'm wearing a watch today. Um, it's a Clues watch. If and I, I'm not a representative of Clues by any means, uh, but it's actually quite a nice watch. But if I was searching for a Clues watch online and I went and I typed it into the Google search bar and I got a load of results, then I know that if I'm, I'm appearing in those search results, that I'm actually showing myself to someone that has actually searched for that product. So when we talk about a conversion funnel, we talk about people that are at the top of the conversion funnel. So it's people that might be broadly looking for a watch, or they might just be looking for an item of jewelry, they could be looking for a Christmas present, hey, Christmas is around the corner, what can I get for someone? They're all the way up here. By the time that they've narrowed down the fact that they want a clues watch, and they might even want a brown one, I think this is a kind of brownie color, a brown clues watch, then they're fairly far down the conversion funnel. They've already done kind of a lot of the research stage. They know where they're at. They've got an idea of what they want to get. They're typing it into Google. And if you can get your website in the search results when people are actively looking for it, then you're not only capturing new traffic, but you're also capturing new traffic at a moment when they're actively searching for a product or a service that you offer. So let's have a look at the new customer journey. So first and foremost, we have four different aspects of the new customer journey. We've got the stimulus, and ironically, this has a picture of a watch as well on it. So the stimulus is the idea when somebody actively wants to make a purchase. So if they're having to think about it, thinking, right, I know I need to buy something. I really want to, you know, I want to get a watch. Where do I start? Where do I go? What do I do when I know what kind of product I want? Where do I actively look for it? Well, it brings us into the research phase, and the research phase is often the longest phase that we have. So I know that I want to buy a watch, so where might I go? Right, I might go to a shop. Let's say John Lewis, Selfridges, House of Fraser, Debenhams, somewhere that physically sells watches, Goldsmiths, Ernest Jones, maybe a jeweler's, maybe a department store. I'm going to go maybe in-store and have a look at that type of product, and potentially, if you're like me, what you might do is you might go in, have a look at the product, say, that's really nice. I'm going to take a bit of a note of what that model or make number is. I'm going to take it. I'm going to put it into a search engine online, and I'm going to see if I can find it cheaper elsewhere, right? Because a lot of people are driven by price. So the first element of this research journey is that point where they get to the stage where they're actively looking for something, and perhaps they're doing that in an offline element. They might not just be doing that offline, however. They might also be doing that online. So you might have someone that's searching for a watch, or a clues watch, or a pink watch, or a brown watch, or an electronic watch, or an analog watch, or a digital watch, or whatever different type of watch they're looking for. They've entered this research phase, this phase where they're actively looking for something online. They're not yet searching by price, but what they are doing is they're looking for a specific product. So you again have this online kind of research phase. So you've got an offline research phase and you've got an online research phase. Now while you're in this phase, how many different brands and companies are you exposed to? Now if I'm going, uh, let's say I'm in Manchester and I'm going shopping, I have Selfridges, House of Fraser, Debenhams, Ernest Jones, H. Samuel, all, I live near the Arndale, they're all together in one place, so I've exposed myself to five brands. I've then gone online and I've looked again and I've maybe exposed myself to another five brands. 
that are online. So I've now got 10 brands that I need to choose between when it comes to determining what type of watch I want. And that's when it comes to the next stage of the kind of research process, which is where I actively want to know, well, who am I going to buy this product from? Now, in the offline stage of that process, you have a situation where you might have a retailer like John Lewis, House of Frey's, Debenhams, et cetera, that's kind of like a household name, and they're quite well known, and you know friends that have bought there, you know family that have bought there, et cetera, et cetera. But when it comes to the online phase, it's a whole new ball game because all of a sudden you're exposed to retailers that perhaps don't have a physical presence, they're perhaps not that well known, but nonetheless, that doesn't mean that they're dodgy, corrupt, selling counterfeit products, going to steal your money, et cetera, et cetera. Although I know that sometimes when we come across a brand we haven't heard of, we kind of feel like they do. So we almost then go into another research phase, which is where we want to kind of suss out these online companies. Well, you know, this, this company that I've never heard of, how can I get the reassurance that if I buy my product from there, they're £10 cheaper than on the high street, or they're £20 cheaper than their retailers? might seem a little bit suspicious. How can I ally my fears and get an understanding that they're actually a reputable retailer and my money is safe and I know where I'm putting it? Reviews, social proof, trust, word of mouth, talking to friends, talking to relatives, talking to people that you work with, going online, looking at a third party review site. Trustpilot, FIFO, I mentioned them earlier. Most, a lot of these online companies will have tens of thousands of reviews that will come up getting that kind of social proof. What have other people seen? How has the experience been for other people? What are they seeing on social media? What are they seeing on Google My Business? So all of a sudden, what used to be this research phase where we would probably go into one, two, three high street stores, have a look around, maybe have a bit of a jostle on price, but they would all be fairly similarly priced, has now come to this point where we've got an off offline phase, an online phase, and then a research phase to understand, well, actually, who is the best kind of person that we want? And we had a small problem with the presentation. I'm just going to keep talking. That's fine. So after we go through, luckily I do know this presentation really well. So after we go through the research phase, we then go to the purchase phase. And this is where it becomes really important to understand where we're going on with these online reviews, because that is what's really going to help to determine the kind of, um, you know, the kind of products that we're buying, what we need from that. So, as I mentioned earlier, if you don't have an online presence yet, and you do feel that people are coming and they're looking for product or looking for a service, just out of interest, how many people are product-based? How many people are, so? Uh, how many people have e-commerce? Any e-commerce? Okay, so this is a really irrelevant example. How many of you are service-based? Cool. All all examples moving forward will be service-based. Um, so for those of you that are service-based, if people are coming online, we've got to remember again the geographic reach. So services used to be quite geographic. They used to be quite local. People wouldn't look for people in their local area. Now with the advent of the internet, we're getting to a stage where actually people are able to access uh, products and services outside of their local area. And as a result, we're finding that that geographical reach is a lot bigger. But even because, because you are outside of your local area, what you'll probably find is people might not have heard of you or they might not be aware of you. And that's where the testimonials and the reviews become really, really important. So if you are looking for people to convert, I'm not going to use the example of the watch. Let's say that you want someone to make an inquiry, for example. Then it's really important that you think about where people are going to get that social proof before they make that inquiry. Now, the next, pro next slide of the presentation is a video. When these guys get it back up and running, we'll play the video. But I'm going to move on to the next part, which actually talks about search engine optimization. So how many of you here do any search engine optimization? Couple of people. So for those of you that do, and I promise I'll only ask one question, what kind of things do you do? Blogging. Sorry? Blogging. Blogging? Okay, cool. Fresh content. Fresh content, yep. So that's actually something that a couple of people have mentioned to me today already. Blogging, fresh content, adding more content to the website. Google does love content and is very content driven. At the end of the day, when it comes to search engine optimization, what you need to remember is that Google is a business like any other business and it needs to be delivering what it's promising to the user. Now, what Google promises to the user is that when you type something in the Google search box, you're going to be taken to the best and most relevant search result. And the way that the Google algorithm works is that it is designed to deliver exactly that. So how do you get your website to be the best and the most relevant search result? So there's kind of three things that are really important. You've probably heard the term keywords banded about quite a lot. So keywords are important, and the reason that they're important is because Google is a robot at the end of the day. 
Although there is a human element to it, when it comes to something that's looked at algorithmically, it is a robot that's reading and understanding what is on your website. So you need to make it really, really clear what your website is about. Can someone please give me an example of their service company and what, what industry they're in? Tax. Tax. OK, cool. So if we talk, let's talk about tax. Let's say, for example, we want to talk to people that are looking for inheritance tax. As an exit. Do you do inheritance tax? Cool. Perfect. Now, if we are, but we might do, let's say, for example, we are a tax company. We might do a lot of different tax. We might do corporation tax. We might do inheritance tax. We might do um, another type of tax. I'm not. <laughs> some other tax. <laughs> that just makes me look really bad. Um, but let's say, for example, we do those two. Uh, let's say, for example, our website's quite small, and we've got about five pages on it, which is, you know, can be fairly standard for a small business website. We have a home page, an about page, a services page, a contact us page, and maybe a testimonials or a photos page. And on that website, on the home page, we say we are um, corporate business um, inheritance tax specialists, all on that home page. Now, Google's going to look at that home page, and it's going to say, OK, so you do corporation tax, you do inheritance tax, you do business tax, you do personal tax, you do all these different things, and we know that you do it, but do you excel in any of these areas? Because Google's looking at that page and saying, we do all of these things, but if I send a user that's specifically looking for something on inheritance tax to this page, are they going to land on that page and also get information about corporation tax, personal tax, business tax, all these other taxes that might not be relevant to them? Are they going to be confused? Are they going to leave? Are they going to get what they need to get? Now, let's compare that to another structure of a website where, again, you have those five pages, but you have a service page that is specifically dedicated to inheritance tax. On this page, you have uh, some really good content that talks about inheritance tax and talks about the service that you offer, talks about why someone might need to use it, what benefits you offer, how you can help someone you know, get around their inheritance tax problems or whatever it is, whatever kind of service <coughs> that you offer. Google's going to look at that page, and it's going to say, right, this page is purely about inheritance tax. If someone's looking for inheritance tax, which page is, going to, is Google going to think is the most relevant? Is it going to be the page that's purely about inheritance tax, that has a really clear title of inheritance tax, it's got good content on there, it's got good imagery, it's got a nice form capture, it's nice and fast, or is it going to send people to the page which might be from equally as good a company, but it's cluttered with five or six or seven different types of tax where the user then has to go and kind of navigate through what they're actually looking for. It's going to send people to the inheritance tax page. And the point that I'm trying to make here is when you identify the keywords that you want to rank for and you identify the services that you want to push, split them out, put them into service pages and make those pages unique for the user. Make sure that when the user lands on that page, it's super relevant for that term. Try and only have maximum one to two keywords, perhaps, per page, and really, really focus in on them. And that kind of brings me to my second point, which is about usability. Now, again, Google wants to deliver a great user experience. And site speed is really, really important. What we found last year was that mobile search overtook desktop search for the first time. More people than ever are searching on a mobile than they've ever been before. What this means, however, is that people are more impatient. And also, we have to make sure that our websites are mobile friendly. Does anyone here not have a mobile friendly website? Awesome. Google did introduce a penalty about 18 months ago for websites that weren't mobile friendly. And if you do have a mobile friendly website now, I would encourage you to make it responsive. What that means is that it basically shrinks and expands to do with the screen size that you have. So if you have a tablet, it will shrink to the size of the tablet. If you have a mobile, regardless of what size you have, you might have an iPhone X, 8, 6, 4, Samsung, Sony, whatever it might be, it will shrink and it will grow to fit the size of the screen. Um, the main reason that I'd suggest that you go for responsive is because generally from a site speed perspective, it can be a little bit quicker. Now, in terms of site speed, Google likes your website to load in under three seconds. Generally, anything more than three seconds and the user loses patience and leaves. We have a really handy tool, and it's called testmysite.withgoogle.com. If you go onto this tool, you can also Google the Google, My, uh, Google Mobile Friendly tool. You can go onto it. You can enter your website into that. Bear in mind, it does it at page level, so it might be nice to test it on both the home page and also a sub page. 
and you can run through that and Google will give you a score out of 100 for your desktop speed, your mobile speed, and what it calls mobile friendliness. Now what I mean by mobile friendliness is things like, when I open it on mobile, am I confronted by a giant pop-up which I can't get rid of and therefore can't get to the website? That would not be mobile friendly, that would drive someone nuts. So basically, anything that's seen as a pop and if you do have a pop-up on the website, and a lot of people do use them, they can be really good from a conversion perspective. Make sure that you bear in mind that for a mobile, you want to keep them as best as you can to the screen size. Other things like, are your touch points too close? If you have big fingers like I do, and all of you have maybe five services across your menu, and you've crammed them all into one, and I'm hitting for one, and I'm actually hitting three at the same time, really frustrating. Again, something else you can be penalized, your touch points being too close. Is your website fast on mobile? Now, what makes your website fast on desktop? might not necessarily make it fast on mobile. So bear this in mind when it comes to putting your website together. If you are looking to get a new website or maybe redo your website, consider making it mobile first. From next year, Google's gonna be running a separate index, a mobile, friend, a mobile first index. So it will be taken into consideration that most people are searching by mobile first. So have a think about that when it comes to setting that up for your business. Other things to think about from a search engine optimization perspective, links. So when it comes to determining the strength or the authority or, or kind of how Google sees your website, one thing it looks at is other websites that are linking in towards your website. Do you have good websites linking to your website? Do you have bad websites linking to your website? What do I mean by a good or a bad website? A good website might be a daily newspaper, BBC, Guardian, Daily Mail, Huffington Post, well-established, well-respected, informative, charities, universities, um, educational institutions, big businesses, etc. Good, strong websites. What do I mean by a bad website? Bad website could be like a directory that's been set up purely to list websites on there. Could be spammy, it could have adult content, it could have yeah, a range of things that we don't want to be associated with our website. So when it comes to thinking about how you build what we call the off-page authority of your website, think about the quality of links that are coming into your website, how many are coming into your website, and where they are coming from. It's kind of like living in a neighborhood. If you are in a good neighborhood, then you're probably going to be seen to be in a good area, right? Because you're surrounded by other good people. If you're in a bad neighborhood, you get tarnished again with the brush of being in a bad neighborhood. So make sure that your website, in terms of its link profile, sits within a good neighborhood. Now, the final thing I want to mention when it comes to search engine optimization, because I think it is relevant to the conversation we had earlier, is Google My Business. Now, how many people here have a local business or something that people would search for locally? OK, cool. And how many of you have a Google My Business listing? OK, so there's a couple. So just to explain, you don't need to have a website to have a Google My Business listing. So if a website has been a barrier to market and it's something that you're like, I'm not ready for a website just yet, but I do still want to be found locally, then you can go to google.co.uk slash business and set up a Google My Business listing. What does this involve? It's really straightforward and it takes about five minutes. Basically, you go on, you input your business name, you put some photographs on there, you put your address, you put a contact number, you put your opening hours on there, you put your map marker on there so you'll mark where it physically is on the map. And then what Google will do is about two weeks later, it will send you out a postcard. And on the postcard, it will ask you just to verify that that is where your actual business is because it wants to make sure obviously where it puts the map positioning is in the correct position. And then you will go and you will be added to Google Maps. And then when we asked the question earlier of how many people search locally for a business, then you have the opportunity for your business to come up when someone is searching locally for your product or service. Now, for those of you that don't have it, like I said, it is really quick, really, really easy to sign up for. I definitely encourage that you do it. And if you do sign up for a Google My Business listing, then you want to also think about how you are, how you do appear in what I would call good online directories. So we talked about the yellow pages. The yellow pages is now available online. So have a look at online business listings, 192, Yelp, Yelp, being local. They're all there. Make sure that when you list yourself on there that your business name, address, and postcode, we call it the NAP principle, is the same as what you have set up on your Google My Business listing, and you're away. So we've talked about search engine optimization. So I want to have a quick chat to you guys about Google Analytics. 
Now, for those, is there anyone that doesn't use Google Analytics but is kind of interested in running some analytical software on their website? Cool, I'm going to take that as a yes. So, Google Analytics, if you want to set up Google Analytics, you want to go to google.co.uk slash analytics. What Google Analytics is, is it's a program that runs on your website that allows you to see important information around the kind of visitors that are coming through to your website. So, it's things like, where are your visitors coming from? So, are they coming in organically, so through natural search or search engine optimization? Are they coming in through a paid marketing campaign? Are they coming in through a social media platform like Facebook or Twitter? Which social media platform are they coming in through? They're coming in directly to the website, so by direct traffic what I mean is are they typing an address straight into the address bar? Are they coming in through an email campaign or a display marketing campaign? It allows you to break down where the visitors on your website are coming from, and if you are running a marketing campaign off the back of that, then it allows you to really attribute which marketing campaigns are working for you, which can be a great way to kind of determine where you want to kind of apportion your marketing budget moving forward. Another thing that Google Analytics allows you to do is it allows you to kind of look at where your customers are coming from and how they're accessing your website, which allows you to make important decisions when it comes to giving a good user experience. For example, it'll tell you how many people are coming in on mobile, desktop, or tablet, and more than that, what devices are they coming in on? So are they coming in on an iPhone or a Samsung or you know, a Galaxy Tab or an Android? How are they, you know, what devices are they using to get to the website? And drilling deeper on that information, once you understand what devices people are using to come to your website, which ones are performing and which ones aren't? So you might find that actually people on an iPhone engage for a long time with your website, but people on an iPad are leaving straight away. Or perhaps you've got a bounce rate what I mean by bounce rate is when someone comes onto a website, doesn't engage with it, doesn't click on anything, doesn't go through to another page and leaves straight away. Now, if you have a particular device that has a high bounce rate, chances are that there's something your website isn't doing correctly for that particular device. So you can then go and investigate off the back of that. In the same way that you can identify specific browsers or operating systems, which potentially, again, might you know, cause conflicts, Chrome, Firefox, Edge, they don't work in the same way. They don't have the same features. So your website might work really well on Chrome. It might not work so well on Edge. So use that data to make informed decisions about changes and updates that you might want to make on your website. And you could find that you are able to make a much more engaging user experience as a result of that. The other thing that you can look at in terms of your audience is where have they come from? What country have they come from? Or perhaps more relevantly, what city have they come from? Are they from London, Brighton, Manchester, Leeds, Sheffield? Where are my visitors coming from? It's often quite interesting to see what your geographical reach is, particularly if you're a business that's always traditionally been local. So you can use the, the acquisition tool within uh, Google Analytics to kind of see that information. What else can you see? Well, you can see what people are doing when they're on the website. So what is their behavior? Where have they entered my website? So what is the landing page? What pages are they going to? What is the user flow and the behavior flow throughout the website? How many pages are they going to? What is the average time that they're spending on the site? And where are they leaving the site? So are the particular pages that have a drop-off, are the particular pages that people aren't engaging on, are people getting to the pages that I want them to get to? Now, if you are a service-driven company, the chances are you're going to have a form, maybe a contact us form, or a phone number, or a callback, or something on there. You're going to have a point on your website, which we would call a conversion, where you're going to want people to reach. So use the behavior tool to understand how people are navigating through the website if they're getting to where they need to go. And if they're not, then rework the way that your website works based on that data to make sure that they can get to where they need to be. The final thing that Google Analytics allows you to do is look at your conversions. Now, this is perhaps more predominant if you are in the e-commerce sphere, but again, if you are from a lead generation perspective, you want to understand what marketing channels are working for you. So, again, you can set up particular conversions, which might be a phone call. So maybe someone clicks on the phone number and makes a call. Maybe someone submits a contact form. You know, maybe someone um, signs up for a newsletter. Maybe someone requests a callback. These are all conversions. These are all things that are important to measure. Now, if you set up these conversions and you measure them against the channels that are bringing your traffic in, you might find that you're running one specific marketing campaign that's bringing you a lot of leads, 
And then perhaps, let's say your email marketing campaign is bringing, let's say for example, your paid marketing campaign is bringing you 50 leads. Your email marketing campaign is bringing you five leads and your display marketing campaign is bringing you one lead and you're spending the same amount on each. You can make an informed decision based on that data that actually the paid marketing campaign is working really, really well for you and the display marketing campaign, by contrast, really isn't. So you can take the information that you've got from setting up those conversions and really understand where your customers are coming from, how they're engaging in marketing, and how you can make good marketing decisions off the back of that. So if you don't have Google Analytics set up, it's free, by the way. So is Google My Business. That's also free. I would encourage you to go to google.co.uk slash analytics. Setting it up is really straightforward. Basically, um, what they'll do is they'll give you a snippet of code. You just need to put the code on the website. <laughs> that sounds really easy. It really is that easy. Um, if you have a web developer that works with you, then they can put that on for you. If you don't, and you have uh, maybe like a Wix or a Google, uh, Google Sites or kind of a website you've built yourself, there'll be the option in there to just enter in the ID, and they will have all the code in there for you. So it is really straightforward and quite easy to get it on there. Even if you don't use it as an in-depth tool, it is good to know how many people are coming through to your website and what they're doing on there, because there's probably definitely a way that you're able to monetize that platform a little better. So the last thing that I want to talk about today is Google advertising or pay-per-click. Does anyone in the room do pay-per-click at the moment? OK, cool. So we've got a couple of people that do it. So the Google advertising platform is what you see at the top of the search results. So often you'll see the search results screen. And up the top you'll have three or four results that'll have a little ad in the box next to them. And then underneath you'll have the rest, which is what we call the natural search results or the SEO. Now, Google's pay-per-click model works very much as it says in the name, where you pay per click. So if you, you can show your ad as many times as you like, but if no one clicks on it, then you won't pay for it. I mean, obviously, that's not ideal because you want people to be clicking on it because you want them to come through to the website. But you will only pay based on when someone clicks through to your website. How does the pay-per-click model work? Well, it's auction-based. So basically, what will happen is you will go into an auction along with all the other people that are competing for a particular keyword. So let's go back to the keyword inheritance tags. So let's say, for example, I want to appear in the search results, the ads, the, ad, the paid search results for inheritance tax. And I'm going into that auction, and there's another 10 people in that auction. So what determines where I appear within that auction result? Well, there's a number of key factors. But one of the most important ones is what we call a quality score. Now, obviously, if you do pay a lot of money, your ads will perform, like you, they will appear quite high, because the way that the algorithm works when it comes to paid advertising is it multiplies the maximum that you're allowed, that you want to pay, so what you call your maximum cost per click, by your quality score. The reason we have a quality score is because we don't want people to just pay to put ads at the top and the ads be rubbish and not deliver a great user experience. So the reason we have the quality score in there is because we want the ad to go to a relevant landing page. So that's one element of the quality score. So when someone clicks through on the ad, we want to make sure that it goes through to the right landing page and that the landing page experience is good for the user. We also need to make sure that the ad contains relevant keywords. So if we are talking about inheritance tax, we need to make sure that the ad has inheritance tax in there somewhere. So ad relevancy, again, is another thing. Landing page relevancy, ad relevancy. Click-through rate, again, is really important. What I mean by click-through rate is, is the percentage of times that your ad appears and then gets clicked on. Now, if you have a really good ad, and it's really, you know, it's, it's nice and salesy, and it sells you USPs, and you've got a really great product, people will click on your ad. It's force of nature. Now, click-through rate is an important element of your quality score. Keyword relevancy, ad relevancy, landing page relevancy, click-through rate. Multiplied by your bid will give you what we call an ad rank. All of the businesses will be ranked, and the person with the highest ad rank will appear at the top of the paid search results. That's a really top-level way of explaining it, but that's basically what happens when it comes to the pay-per-click platform. Why do people use pay-per-click? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, because a lot of people don't have ad blindness. So a lot, I know I tend to have ad blindness, and what that means is when I go and I look at something in the search results, I automatically just don't look at the ads. Probably because I've worked with them for a long time, and also probably because I know how much it can cost people when I click on one, that I feel bad for clicking on them, so I tend to go to the organic search results. Especially if, like you're in, let's say, for example, tax is an, you know, an expensive industry for pay-per-click. 
So if you're in that kind of industry, I always feel bad clicking on an ad. So even though someone might have a phenomenal ad at the top, I can't bring myself to do it, and I will go to the organic search results. However, most people aren't like that, and they will tend to click on the ads. More than that, um, what we tend to find is a lot of people that are starting up will look at something like pay-per-click models. The reason? Because SEO takes time. You won't, um, even if you invest money in search optimization and you spend a lot of time optimizing your website, creating really great content, making it fast, these things don't happen overnight. You don't build authority in a website overnight. So it can take a little while for you to get the rankings that you're looking for. One of the reasons that people use pay-per-click is because it's instant. So you literally, so I, I kind of liken it to a tap. You can turn it on and the water will flow, the customers will flow, provided you have good ad copy and a good landing page. Turn it off, and again, the customers will stop, unless you've got a good organic marketing campaign going on to back that up. So if you are looking for something that's quick, you're looking for something that works immediately, then you might want to look at something like pay-per-click. In terms of creating really good ad copy, because that is important when it comes to getting that quality score up, there's a couple of things to bear in mind. When you put your ad out, you are selling your business in a competitive environment. So you need to be competitive with that ad. You need to get your unique selling points in that ad. Because at that very point, it doesn't matter. You might have a phenomenal landing page. You might be offering 50% off your, your first month's fees. But if you're not selling that in the ad, people aren't going to click through to the landing page. So make a great landing page, but sell those really important elements of the landing page in your ad. Make sure that you use all of the options that you have available when it comes to ads. So we have a lot of ad extensions, call extensions, call ad extensions, signing extensions, there's tons of them. Extensions that you can put on your ad to take up as much real estate as possible. And real estate is key when it comes to Google search because you want to be taking up as much real estate as possible and even going back to Google My Business. When someone searches for your brand, the Google My Business listing is huge on the right-hand side if you're searching on desktop. And if you're searching on mobile, it's often the thing that appears at the very top. So again, you want to find ways to own as much of that real estate as possible. So when it comes to creating ad copy, keep your USPs in there. Quick tip, capitalize the first letter of every word. It's, it's a bit of a strange one, but it looks really good when you put it into an ad. Don't capitalize full words. You will get penalized for it. It is against ad advertiser guidelines but feel free to capitalize the first letter of each word. If you want words to appear on a second line at a full stop, there's lots of little tips and tricks that you can do around Google Ads to make them really stand out and display really well. But if you are going to start an advertising campaign, make sure that you've checked all of your conversion funnels first. The, uh, the worst thing that you can possibly do is pay for people to come to your website and find that they aren't able to convert. So. If you were in e-commerce, make sure that your checkout works. Make sure there's no barriers to conversion. Make sure there's not a confusing capture on there that's frustrating people. Test and test and test the way that people convert. So even if you're working for lead generation, how much information do you take off someone once they arrive on that landing page? Do they have to go through three or four or five steps to actually submit that information? Or are they able to, to submit it really easily in three or four lines? Think about all, this, all of this kind of conversion optimization that you can put into the website before you think about paying to actually send people to the website. Because all you will do if you don't have a solid conversion funnel is you will end up paying to send people and they won't convert at the end. So think about your landing page experience. Think about a landing page that converts. And when people come through to your website, make sure that you reiterate the key points that you had within your ad. So if you said in your ad, we're going to offer 50% off uh, first-time consultation to people, make sure that you sell that on your landing page and that it's really obvious what you're doing. Think about all your very important attributes. So what are all these selling points that you want to put on there? Maybe put on there a little bit of a discount or a little bit of a, you know, something to just kind of nudge people over the line. Think about making it sell. Think about the colors and the images that you use on that landing page. And think about if this person comes through from this ad and they just land on this page, are they able to do everything that I need them to do on this page? Or do they need to go to another three, four, or five pages on the website before they can get to that result? Because for, I guarantee you, for every extra page they need to go to, you're going to lose 10%, 20% along the way. So if you are going to set up a paid advertising campaign, I'd highly recommend that you think about the landing pages and the pages that you're sending people to 
Put as much information as you can on them. Don't overcrowd them, of course. But also don't put things on there that are going to take them away. So let's say, for example, you do set up a landing page. You have everything on there. You've got your USPs. And then say you're an e-commerce retailer. And actually, you've decided to have a flash sale today. And you've got a massive flash sale banner all over the top. So someone's come in. I'm going to go back to the Clues Watch. They've come in. They want to buy the Clues Watch. They've searched for Clues Watch. They've got it in their mind. They want that. They're on the landing page. They're about to add it to the bag. But hang on a minute. There's a flash sale going on. All of a sudden, they're thinking, hang on a minute. I might be able to get a cheaper watch somewhere else. They've gone off that Clues page. They've clicked on the Flash Banner ad. They've gone through to the Flash Deals page. They've looked through all the Flash Deals. Nah, it's all rubbish. Nothing on there that I want. And all of a sudden, actually, they're like, oh, time up. I've had enough. I can't be bothered buying the watch now. And they've left. It might sound crazy, but you know, if you're putting things on that landing page that are taking away from the original goal that they looked to achieve, then you are actually hindering your own path to conversion. So if you are going to set up a paid marketing campaign, think about your landing page. Think about the way that you want people to convert and tie that into your marketing strategy. I'm really sorry about what happened to the presentation. Um, but that is basically what I wanted to go through with you guys today. Um, as I mentioned earlier, what we're doing with the Google Digital Garage is we're going out and providing free digital skills training to as many people as possible across the UK. If you do have any questions about the program, we're going to do a short Q&A now anyway with regards to what I've just spoken to. But if you do have any questions, please do come and see me. If you do want any one-to-one -one mentoring, then please go down to the garage in Birmingham, um, and they'll be more than happy to help you out. Hi, my name is Matt Cutts. I'm an engineer in the quality group at Google, and I'd like to talk today about what happens when you do a web search. The first thing to understand is that when you do a Google search, you aren't actually searching the web. You're searching Google's index of the web, or at least as much of it as we can find. We do this with software programs called spiders. Spiders start by fetching a few web pages. Then they follow the links on those pages and fetch the pages they point to and follow all the links on those pages, and fetch the pages they link to, and so on, until we've indexed a pretty big chunk of the web, many billions of pages stored across thousands of machines. Now, suppose I want to know how fast a cheetah can run. I type in my search, say, cheetah running speed, and hit return. Our software searches our index to find every page that includes those search terms. In this case, there are hundreds of thousands of possible results. How does Google decide which few documents I really want? By asking questions, more than 200 of them. Like, how many times does this page contain your keywords? Do the words appear in the title, in the URL, directly adjacent? Does the page include synonyms for those words? Is this page from a quality website, or is it low quality, even spammy? What is this page's page rank? That's a formula invented by our founders, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, that rates a web page's importance by looking at how many outside links point to it and how important those links are. Finally, we combine all those factors together to produce each page's overall score and send you back your search results about half a second after you submit your search. At Google, we take our commitment to delivering useful and impartial search results very seriously. We don't ever accept payment to add a site to our index, update it more often, or improve its ranking. Let's take a look at my search results. Each entry includes a title, a URL, and a snippet of text to help me decide whether this page is what I'm looking for. I also see links to similar pages, Google's most recent stored version of that page, and related searches that I might want to try next. And sometimes, along the right and at the top, I'll see ads. We take our advertising business very seriously as well, both our commitment to deliver the best possible audience for advertisers and to strive to only show ads that you really want to see. We're very careful to distinguish your ads from regular search results. And we won't show you any ads at all if we can't find any that we think will help you find the information you're looking for, which in this case, the cheetah's top running speed is more than 60 miles an hour. Thanks for watching. I hope this made Google a little bit more understandable.
Hey, just that, thanks. You sure? Uh, yeah. Username? Oh, uh, Nick M? No. NM1983? No. I, uh, Zandy Pops? Sorry. <clears throat> Zandy Pops? No, OK. Don't worry, I'll help. What's your postcode? Oh, it's uh, GU749ZT. Welcome back, Nick, forever. Oh, okay. Please listen carefully to this bread licence agreement before continuing with your purchase of a loaf of bread. If you do not, blah, blah, blah. You also agree not to use any bread-based products for any purposes prohibited by United Kingdom law, including without limitation of design, development, manufacture of missiles, chemical, nuclear or biological weapons. Tick. I'm afraid you've timed out. What? Sorry. He Hello? Excuse me. Oh, yeah, hey. Just one loaf, sir? Yeah, we just... What's your username? It's uh, Nick Forever, but number four, not the... Gotcha. Yeah. OK, I'm just going to check that you're a real person. Could you say that for me? That's not even a word. OK, how about this one? You know what, forget it. it, it or this one? Uh, Hippopotamice. You're in. Great, I'm in. £8.85. It's supposed to be 98 pence. Plus express delivery. What's that? Oh, well, it's express delivery. It's fast. So there's, um... <laughs> Standard. Oh, standard. Standard delivery. That's four pounds ninety nine. Why? Bread insurance. You didn't untick the don't decline bread insurance option. You know what? I think I'll risk it. It is quite close to the sell by date. Don't care. Ninety eight pence it is. If you want to pop back in five business days, it'll be ready for your collection. Well, well, well I need it now, obviously. Oh, okay. Uh, you want the take home today price? Well, that's three pound twenty seven. You know what? I'm going to go. Come back soon. I won't. Dear customers, this store will be closing in ten minutes. Please proceed to the checkout.